Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to really interesting people, international stars, and people who fascinate me. One man who is certainly ticking all those boxes right now is Dickie Arbiter. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And you? It's a real pleasure to see you, and I'll tell you why. I first met you nearly 20 years ago when I was just a cub reporter, and I came down to Buckingham Palace, and there you were representing Her Majesty, and you were very gracious to give me a tour and talk to me afterwards. Since then, I see you everywhere. You're the man to go to on CNN or Fox or the BBC. It must be great to be you. Uh, it is wonderful to be me. I wouldn't like to be anybody else. I've been great to be me since I was born on the 25th of September 1940, and I'm going to carry on being me for a long time to come. I don't blame you, because when I think about what you've seen, what you've experienced, and the people you've met, I mean, what a life you've had. Firstly, I've got to ask the question that comes to me first, which is, when did it become normal to sit next to the Queen and you were relaxed? I've always been relaxed. I don't do stress. Somebody once said to me with, uh, with the breakup of Charles and Diana's wedding, don't you get stressed? And I said, why should I be stressed when two people are being so very silly? Uh, so I don't do stress. Um, Queen is just another person. Yes, she was my employer uh, and I do respect her and I bow when I see her for the first time and I call her Your Majesty the first time and ma'am the rest of the time. But no, I'm sort of fairly relaxed and I will talk to her in the same way as I'm talking to you now. I think you either had the best time to be working for the royal family or the worst. It was certainly the time for the most publicity. It had endless stories, good and bad. Unfortunately, many of them were bad. So to set this whole interview up, you were the press secretary for Her Majesty the Queen. What does that mean? It means that you're there at the sharp end responding to any media inquiries, whether it's uh, UK or foreign, uh, whether it's print or electronic. And at the time I was there, we were reactive, unfortunately, than proactive. Today they're proactive because there's nothing really hostile going on. But we were reactive because we had Charles and Diana's marriage going down the tubes. We had Fergie and Andrew's marriage going down the tubes. So it wasn't a particularly good time. Then we had things like a fire at Windsor Castle. We had uh, rather peculiar people breaking into Buckingham Palace, which wasn't terribly helpful at all. Um, we just had all sorts of things happening that shouldn't have happened, but they did, and we reacted to it, reacted to it best we could. How do you know you're making the right call when the phone comes in and they say, we've got a picture of a certain royal member of the family who's sucking someone else's toe, and you then have to give a statement in defense of that? How do you know you get it right? Is it just an instinct? Well, it is an instinct, but when you get somebody sucking somebody else's toe, you say, well, you've got the picture, you make up your own mind about it. <laughs> it's when you get a, a, somebody phoning you at three o'clock, asking you a very silly question, was Prince Philip ever in the Navy? Uh, it's then you tend to use an expletive and put the phone down. Um, but uh, yeah, you just make a judgment call at the time. Uh, I, I suppose my radio training, which does teach you to ad lib, uh, is, is a good background rather than television where you're dependent on an auto cue. God help the television presenters if the auto cue breaks down. So yes, you are, you, you, you sort of do make a judgment call at the time and um, most of the time it's right. As I always do in these in-depth interviews, let's go back right to the beginning. Were you always communicative? Were you always a talker? Oh, I've always been a talker, I've never been a writer. I, I, I worked hard at school, but I never did homework. Um, so that probably contributes to my lack of being able to write properly. I can write a good letter. Um, I suppose I can write a, a short article, but when it comes down to, to writing a book, I, I write as I talk. Uh, and I hope that comes out in the book, that it comes out as, as a narrative. But yes, I, I was always a talker. I was like chatting, chatting to people, um, telling people what to do, how to do and when to do it. Don't care how you do it, as long as you do it my way sort of thing. On Duty with the Queen is this new book that's out and it's getting coverage everywhere. Have you been surprised how many people are interested in this around the world? I have been surprised. You, you know, you, you go into it with a certain cautious optimism. Uh, you don't go in gung-ho because at the end of the day, it is a personal decision. Do you buy it and read it or do you borrow somebody else's book and read it? Um, and I am cautiously optimistic and I hope it does work. I've got to remember, it's not another royal book. There have been a few sort of uh, acerbic comments um, suggesting, oh God, you know, here we go again, do you have to do it? And I won't go into detail because I haven't read them. It's not another royal book, it is an autobiography. It starts um, from when I was born on the 25th of September 1940 to the present day, and it dips in and out of my life outside of the palace. Yes, obviously 12 years of my 74 years were spent in the palace, but there's a lot more to my life than just that. 
At the beginning of your career, you were in South Africa and you were a reporter. That was your proper job, wasn't it? No, at the beginning of my career, I was in what is was known as Southern Rhodesia. It's now uh, Zimbabwe. And uh, yeah, I, I went there with my mother, age 17, having... Uh, been asked rather nicely to leave my school, my grammar school. The headmaster at the time thought um, I was wasting their time and my mother's money. I was always in the top three in, uh, in class, but I just never did homeworks. So I never did the coursework, so I'd, I didn't do GCE. And when I got to Rhodesia, the family decided I was going to do what they wanted to do, and then I could go and do what I liked. And I can waste my life, I can do whatever. So I learned to become an electrician for five years, hated every minute of it, could do it, uh, again communicated and in that period of time I was doing amateur theatre I was doing a bit of broadcasting I've been invited to do that so that by the time I finished my five-year apprenticeship I then hopped on a train and went to South Africa and thought I'd see seek fame and fortune and stardom in South Africa well I didn't seek anything in South Africa I had a, I was acted in a few plays I stage managed a, a, a few productions I did a little bit of radio and after two and a half years I hopped on an aeroplane and came back to the UK seeking fame and fortune and stardom well i didn't get that either um, <laughs> stardom's not going well so far is it? it's not going well it's not terribly well no um, and i ended up by doing children's theater which was a terrific learning curve it was absolutely wonderful performing before children six plays with the unicorn theater for children and then i thought well i'm not getting anywhere i might as well play so i played for another year uh wastrel went back to what was still rhodesia uh, and joined the Rhodesia Broadcasting Court. No, it wasn't then. It was the Southern Rhodesia Broadcasting Corporation because there'd been UDI and the whole federation thing had split up. And things just went from strength to strength. And I was doing stuff for South African Broadcasting Corporation, for the Radio South Africa, which is external service. But I was also going in and out of the army, which I was getting a bit tired of. If you were sort of of a certain age, you had to do military service. A bit like territorials, but you had to do it. You had no choice. Um, and by 74, well, 73, I'd heard that commercial radio was starting here in the UK. So I thought, well, I'll give myself a chance there. So I resigned from Rhodesia Broadcasting, hopped on an aeroplane in 74 after my daughter was born and started at LBC News Radio within four days of getting back here. Um, from then on, yeah, I didn't see, I, I saw fame, um, maybe a bit of stardom, not a fortune, never really sought a fortune. Uh, I've sought it, but it's eluded me. Um, but um, yeah, and things went from strength to strength. I was there for 15 years before I was invited to join the palace. When you were there at LBC in the early days, just less than a mile away from Buckingham Palace, did you ever think one day that you'd be part of that inner circle and you'd be feeding the news the other way? Never thought for, of it for a moment. I did become court correspondent um, sort of in 1980. Um, I did cover the, the, the Silver Jubilee of 77 and became court correspondent, which meant I was accredited to the palace. So I had a little more entree uh, there and I knew everybody, everybody knew me. I knew how the press office worked. Um, I'd interviewed most members of the royal family, but I never thought for a moment that I'd get a job there. And it was really just before the eve of departure for Australia for the Queen's Bicentennial Tour in 88, that I had this phone call. I was sort of coming up to 48 and I was thinking about the last 10 years of my full-time working life. In those days, you retired at 60 had to retire at 60. Um, and this phone call came, if I was approached, would I be interested? I thought, yeah, I'd be interested. And the rest is history. So, okay, day one then, we arrive at Buckingham Palace. How do we get the job? Well, there wasn't actually an audition because I, as I said, I said a moment ago, I knew everybody. Um, I was going out to Australia to cover the bicentennial. I met a uh, private secretary there whom I knew because he was one time press secretary at the palace and got bumped up to a sort of more senior job. And then um, I had a meeting uh, in Britannia. But we started in Perth and we sort of worked our way around and eventually ended up in Sydney. And Britannia was there and the Queen was staying on Britannia. There was going to be a reception for the great and the good of Australia. And there was a meeting scheduled there with the private secretary. And it was, it was very informal, sort of, well, you know the terms, are you interested? Yes, I'm interested. Okay, uh, when you get back to London, come in and see us and we'll chat over the nuts and bolts. Well, we chatted over the nuts and bolts when I got back to London. That was um, middle of May. Uh, by the end of May, I resigned from LBC. And by the beginning of July, I started at Buckingham Palace. So it was all very quick. 
What is that feeling like the first time you walk in a room like I just did today meeting you, but she's the queen and you've got to now represent her and effectively defend her, haven't you? Well, I was rather lucky because I had met her before on previous occasions. I'd met her in Jordan, I met her in China and I met her in Australia. You know, not to have a long chat, but she knew who I was and I who knew she was, which I would do, wouldn't I? Um, but uh, so it wasn't so much, um, I wasn't worried about it. And I've always been somebody who will talk to somebody on the same level while still respecting that they are my employer or they are more senior than I am. Uh, so it, there wasn't any sort of concern. Uh, and I think I displayed this when I went up to Balmoral. I think it's less of a PR world in those days when you started as it is today. But nevertheless, the word has got to be trust, hasn't it? That she's got to trust you. How long was it before you felt like she trusted you? It wasn't very long. Um, when the head of state calls you by your given name, then you know that you're okay. And she started calling me Dickie fairly soon, fairly soon in. So I knew that I was okay. Um, if it's Mr. Arbiter or not even referring to you by name, then you've got a problem. You were involved in so many scandals through those years that you were at the palace. Which one brings the hairs back up on the back of your neck and you wish you could either live again, do differently or avoid? Well, I was never actually involved in the scandals because they were actually created by, by the principals themselves. I mean, firstly, there's the uh, Diana Who True Story, the book by Andrew Morton, which uh, she denied having given help to, but she did indirectly through an intermediary. Uh, there was uh, the Prince of Wales's interview in which he confessed to having committed adultery while married to Diana, which he did actually interestingly enough, sitting in the choir stalls at St George's Chapel, Windsor. And then there was Diana's panorama um, a year later, in which she said there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. So there were things that were created by them. The original Prince of Wales interview was supposed to be rather bland. It was going to be a, a sort of a bit of a biog uh, of what a jolly fine fellow is, the sort of charitable work that he does to coincide with the 25th anniversary of investiture. Somebody moved the goalposts and it became an hour and a half. It became confessional. Um, and it was all wrong, and people remember it for his confession rather than for anything else. So they were things that of their making rather than my making. I suppose the one long-standing memory I have is really the funeral, the death and the funeral. Uh, we gave her a jolly good send-off. Um, we did things right. We, and I say we, being Buckingham Palace, there was no D Downing Street interference. They wouldn't have been allowed to interfere anyway because they didn't know what to do. Um, the only tick in the box that they did was that the there'd be unlimited funds to do what we had to do. Uh, but that is it, and, and we did do a good job. And I think most people will agree to that. Two questions on the back of that. I'll come to the second in a moment. On that specific point, there was though a point where the Queen was questioned about not being at Buckingham Palace, not saying anything. She then came back and did, and the whole world relaxed. Were you involved in that decision? Did you encourage her to, or did you initially at the beginning say, just hold off, wait for a moment? Firstly, the Queen doesn't do things to order. She doesn't do things to an agenda. She does things when she feels that it is right to do. Um, and if she had paid a tribute to Diana, on the Monday, the day after she died, she would have been expected to do something else at the end of the week. And it was a conscious decision that A, she was going to come back at the end of the week in time for the funeral, and B, that she was going to pay tribute to Diana, but in her own way, in her own time. Uh, the fact is that uh, Charles, uh, Prince of Wales, and William and Harry came back the day before. Uh, you may remember that uh, they walked around Kensington Gardens, absolute composure written all over their faces. There's a saying in royal circles, you don't wear private grief on a public sleeve. And they did a marvellous job, while all around them people were we weeping and wailing. The next day the Queen came back to London, and she first of all went to look at the books of condolence, a walkabout afterwards. There was polite applause from mourners waiting to sign the books. She then went down to Buckingham Palace and did the same, did a walkabout in an enclosure, put flowers down for people, talked to mourners and left to go back into the palace. And again, when she arrived and when she left, there was polite applause. Now the media got it wrong. They were looking for a story. By Wednesday, there was no story to be had. Diana had died. The funeral arrangements were, were all out. The biographies of Diana, what she had done, were all out. They had to find something else. So they whipped up um, a public frenzy against the royal family. For the first time in her reign, the Queen put family before duty. They forgot 
the media that there was a 12 year old and a 15 year old grieving for the tragic loss of their mother in such public circumstances and if it hadn't been for their grandparents they wouldn't have been able to do what they did on the day of the funeral and that's walk behind the gun carriage absolutely dry-eyed and stoic they couldn't have done it but it was their grandparents both the queen and the duke of edinburgh who put them into a position where psychologically they could do it. Psychologically they could do what they did in Kensington Gardens to walk around when all around them people were weeping wailing. These are two teenagers. What teenager can do that? It's a very hard thing to do, but they did it. And if it hadn't been for their grandparents, it would have been a very different story on the day of their funeral. And I think the great British public realized that it was their grandparents and it was their dad who had been up there with them to counsel them, to help them get through the first few days, to let them go off on the estate and do what they like, when they like and how they like, that they were able to do what they did on the day of the funeral. Aside from Diana being a mother and being someone's daughter and brother and having a grandmother and all the emotion involved, from a press officer's point of view, was she a thorn in your side? Diana wasn't a thorn in, a, in anybody's side. She did do some things that didn't necessarily approve of like helping Andrew Morton with his with his book indirectly by doing panorama um, she did ask she did ask she did ask advice about things that she had an idea to do uh, and if they were fine I'd say yeah but it could work we'll make it work or if it was a loopy idea or it had every uh, possibility of not working I'd say so and if it was something that it wasn't going to work um, and I said so she wouldn't talk to me for a couple of weeks and then she wants something done pick up the phone Dickie can you do XYZ and she'd giggle I'd say are we talking again there'd be another giggle and off we go again so she wasn't a thorn in the side there are I suppose the old courtiers sort of um, the, the sort of military types and the sort of old-fashioned courtiers probably thought she was a thorn in the side but she did things differently but when she did them she got things done and she brought attention she brought attention to the fact that you couldn't get AIDS by shaking hands with somebody which she did in 1985 or 86 I think it was at the Middlesex Hospital she brought attention to the fact that you can't catch leprosy by holding somebody's stump which she did in Indonesia in 89 uh, she brought attention to the the dangers of landmines uh, which she did after she got separated so she did a lot of good things uh, but thought in the side no did things differently some people liked the idea other people didn't queen didn't have a problem with that nor did the prince philip i've got infinite questions for you we're never going to get to any of them the question i've got to ask is the gentlemanly agreement between her majesty and the press officer should you be morally writing this book and talking to me now i've got to ask that question well you're quite entitled to ask that question and had i written it immediately after retiring from buckingham palace i would have been not morally right probably wrong sort of r rushing to print a spill all this is not a spill all book it is an autobiography it is about me it is about from the day i was born on in september 1940 to the present day the fact that 12 years of my life 74 years happened to be at buckingham palace yes you've got to include it as i've included everything else uh, it is a reflective look back uh, on my time there it is in some instances setting the record straight I did tell Buckingham Palace I was doing it nine months ago they did see the manuscript uh, the book is being published that speaks volumes absolutely your take then as we sit here now on that insight that you've gained do you have sympathy for the royal family I wouldn't personally want to be them as glamorous as their life may be with private jets and huge palaces it wouldn't be a life for me what have you taken from their life and their lifestyle well firstly let me dispel that myth that you just expounded they don't have private jets they're not theirs uh, they are transported around either by the Royal Air Force as our government ministers or by chartered aircraft if they're going uh, overseas usually chartered from British Airways so they don't have private jets palaces well anybody who's been around Buckingham Palace will see that it's not lavish it's not glitzy it's not glamorous it's not the Hollywood type of palace that you would expect in fact there are millionaires living in more ostentatious ways than, than, than our members of the royal family would I want to be them no not particularly because I'd like to lead a private life which they can't they, they're being sort of continually looked at by uh, cameras 
um, and this is great British public too with their phone cameras. Um, they're constantly being written about. Uh, lifestyle? Well, they have a pretty good lifestyle if they're left alone to enjoy it. It's a lifestyle that a lot of people have. They just happen to have it in slightly bigger houses and being able to afford it a little bit better than most people. But I don't think I would like that lifestyle. I'd like to be able to do what I like, how I like, when I like, uh, without having a camera shoved up my nose to doing it. Exactly. And then we look at the royal family today who have never been more popular, really. I mean, they've never had a period of such uh, longevity where it's good press, not bad press. But the boys, are, of course, are the future. Do you worry for them? Do you uh, have concerns that they're, as you say, in this culture of celebrity and sort of becoming celebrities? The, both William and Harry are pretty adept at being able to mastermind what they want to do and what they don't want to do, what they want the media to cover and what they don't want the media to cover. And a good example of that was last year when Prince George was born, when uh, William and Catherine came out with George, they went straight over to the media, they posed for pictures, they answered a few questions and then they went back. And that's, they, they're media managing themselves uh, with help from the press office, but they're the ones that are in control. They were in control up in Anglesey when William was in the Air Force. They were left alone. They weren't left alone in France when Kate was photographed topless in a, in, in a villa. That is unfortunate, but that's paparazzi. But the interesting outcome of that was that the pictures weren't published in the UK. So they're very much in control of their own destiny, as is Harry. Yes, he's done some silly things, strip billiards last year, but then he probably knew he was going to Afghanistan. He thought he'd have a rip-roaring time in case he didn't come back. Why not? Um, most people thought it rather endearing that he that he went that far. But no, I, both William and Harry are in are in control. Uh, they're not, not suggesting for a moment they're control freaks, but they are very much in control of what the press can have, what they can't have, and if they want, then they've got to play by the rules, their rules. Right. If there were to be any royal member of the family here now, it'd probably be Prince Philip I'd want to interview the most. Is he as much fun in real life as he appears from time to time on camera? Prince Philip doesn't suffer fools. Um, he likes good conversation. He likes good company. And if you've got nothing to say, then he can't be bothered with you. He doesn't make small talk. Um, and uh, there, there was a lot written about him years ago, that he was a philanderer, that he, that he sort of... Um, chased after various women, which is couldn't be further from the truth. Um, yeah, he's a good, sort of solid, red-blooded, heterosexual male, uh, but he window shopped. He didn't buy. Talking of which, um, I interviewed Max Clifford a few months ago before all the nonsense happened, and he wrote a book in which he talks about Diana and Hewitt, and he claims he represented Hewitt, and Hewitt is the father to Harry. What is your take on that? Do you have any comment on that whole story that seems to go on and on and on? You know, the, the, the Hewitt-Harry-Diana story is one of those things that's been gathering moss and is a myth that's become fact. Hewitt was after Harry was born. End of. But in the interview I did with Max, he insists it absolutely wasn't. From your perspective and from your knowledge, that was the case, that that did not happen until after Harry was born. Well, if you believe Max Clifford, you believe anything, and um, he wouldn't be where he is now, would he? <laughs> very, very good point. Dickie Arbiter's new book is out now. It is fascinating, not only the life you led in the public eye as the press officer for Her Majesty, but before and after. Your life now, is it thrilling to be sat here talking to idiots like me about your life and to all always be referred to you're the go-to guy around the world aren't you when it comes to royal issues well i'd like to think i'm the go-to guy but please don't be self-deprecating you know you're doing a job uh, you know this is a terrible british habit being self-deprecating come on you know you're going to say i'm great i'm good at what i'm doing because if you weren't you wouldn't be doing it well i'm not bad but it's not like working for a living talking is it everybody else can do it well i, I i'm enjoying i'm enjoying life you know people say well you know you're enjoying retirement enjoying holiday i've been on holiday since i was born it's just that i happen to be working in between um no i'm enjoying myself and life is all about enjoying yourself we're not a long time here and we're a long time dead so make the most of it while we're here very finally, are there another hundred books that could be written if you had the inclination about your 10 years within that royal family? Ask me if there's a next time. Dickie Arbiter, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.